Please help me welcome Richard Grove of Tragedy and Hope. Richard Grove, everyone. Uh, let's see. We'll see how this works out with the mic stand. Thanks for coming out of the rain. Welcome. Everybody having a good time here at Porkfest? Yeah, the weather, it's part of being outside, isn't it cool? And the Wi-Fi reception, how's that going for you guys? A little spotty? That's good, that's another sign of reality. What I'm gonna talk about today is getting back to reality, getting back and talking to people as human beings, not through devices, but sometimes devices can aid in that endeavor. First, I'm gonna start with previously at Porkfest. I didn't make it last year, we were moving, but the year before, we had a nice talk with Patrick Byrne about libertarian economics. I found out my son was not a fan of libertarian economics yet. Maybe this year, right, Luke? Yeah, right? Yeah. So I spoke about uh, a preface to this. So the talk I did in 2017 is not a prerequisite, though if you went back on YouTube and watched it, it would help you understand what I'm gonna unfold for you today. What I mentioned specifically was free speech being censored by internet bureaucracy. I wrote it out so everyone in the back could see it. This was just starting to happen back in 2016, 2017, and people really couldn't see what are gonna be the effects. Well, the effects today are people being censored, demonetized, losing their lifestyle of freedom, and I think that uh, we can do better than that. But to do better than that, we have to put in a little learning. Freedom takes a lot of responsibility, and there's uh, a lot of enjoyment on the other side of that hard work. What we've got going on today is don't let Zuckerberg kill free speech. It's kill free speech. How, is this a 2017 article or is this recent? Last week, a couple of weeks ago. What has changed since 2017? Has the problem gotten better on its own or is it getting worse? Worse. How about this? This just happened. We're talking about the, when, it moved, when it was Alex Jones, everyone said, well, he says some cantankerous things and, you know, it's incendiary and his facts not, there was like excuses. Oh, they could see the censorship for him. But now they're going after people who are not Alex Jones. Uh, the presenter, a couple, a couple presenters earlier, it was all about YouTube censorship, Google censorship. The internet is not your friend unless you are playing its game. It wants you to play its game. So why are we here? Why do we get together at Porkfest? It's a loaded question. All right, so this is what it looked like in 2017. Hopefully we have a little sunshine for the picture when it comes up on Saturday. We all meet in real life. We wanna exchange meaningful information. This is our currency of truth. This is why we come up here. We come up here to see our friends, to make new friends, to hear new information that we can take back to our friends and family and put it together in life for a real tangible effect. By the way, that's, uh, that's us back there. That's where we were for the picture because we were just done filming uh, Lynn Albrecht and we were right over there breaking down the equipment when the picture happened. We all seek this information. It emboldens our lifestyle of, of liberty. That's why we come and sit in the pavilion, not just because it's raining outside, right? So my goal today is to share valuable information with you. But you're going to hear a lot of valuable information. How are you going to take it home with you? How are you going to remember it? I made cheat sheets. So you don't have to remember all the cool stuff I'm going to tell you. I'm basically going to tell you about it and then give you the resources so you have it in print. Once you have it in print, it's a tool you can use to communicate with your friends and family, possibly for the first time. Substantial questions. I'm going to do a quick uh, quiz of the room. It's not a real test. This is about education. How many of you went to public school? All right. How about college degree? All right. Do you use your degree in your daily work? No, I don't. No, I do not. So what happened here? There's a broken link in this chain. We all go through this indoc I'm sorry, education process for 15,000 hours of public schooling. Then we go to university, we get a degree where we learn how to do one thing kind of ambiguously. How's it pan off? I don't, I don't see it working for a lot of people anymore. There was a time when that model worked and today it seems to be a purposely broken link in the chain. This fact adversely affects everybody in terms of freedom. 
now and into the future. So we have here what we call a red pill problem. It is the splinter in your mind. It's that little, why is the school system broken? Why aren't they fixing it? Do we need to put more money in it? Do the people just mean well and they're not doing their job? So the observation I make is that many people leaving the university system are not prepared for the rigors of adult life. They actually have adulting classes now. Have you guys heard of these? You're in your 30s, you don't know how to be an adult yet? I mean, you could come to Porkfest, you got man camp, you learn how to do some welding, some, some forge. A lot of people don't use their degree, they spend a lot of money, a lot of time, families indenture themselves and their children for these degrees. The results are half measures at best. We can make excuses for the system, but really, we have to take note of this, uh, they call it deaths of despair, now among Generation Z or the millennial generation. The, the same generation is told that the world's gonna end in 15 years, or 12 years, depending on which Al Gore video you watch, right? They don't have a reason to fortify themselves with resourcefulness and skills. They are told that they don't have a future. It's not just one magazine. This was everywhere just a few days ago. This is the story of our time. It's not the Iran war. It is the fact that we have a generation of people just killing themselves right now because they can't find meaning in substance. So the benefit or cost that has been given up, let's call that the opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost of being schooled? You're not getting exposed to real life. You're being kept away from real life. You're being indentured to learn things that won't be applicable in what you really want to do in your life for most people. And uh, the, the skills and experience are nil. The confidence level, if anything, is absurdly artificial and superficial. It's not based on competence and skills. It's based on them thinking they got, uh, well, they got indoctrinated. They learned what they were told to do really well, like a program. So the observation coming out of this is kids graduating from school, and this affects all of us that graduated public school, we have short attention spans because every couple, you know, 45 minutes, they'd ring a bell and say, stop thinking about this and start thinking about this over here. Provisional self-esteem, learned helplessness. That's where you don't think you can learn anything for yourself. Oh, I couldn't do that. Instead of saying, how could I learn to do that? What students know they do not need and what they need they do not know. Does that make sense? Is that... Is that a succinct summary of the schooling system. All right, it's going to get a lot worse. All right, so this is a quote from John Taylor Gatto. This comes from his, uh, his article, Why Schools Don't Educate. It is absurd in anti-life to move from cell to cell at the ring of a bell for every day of your natural youth in an institution that allows you no privacy and even follows you into the sanctuary of your home demanding that you do its homework. Right? Homework used to be stuff you did around the house. That was the work at home as opposed to doing work at school. Is this good enough for us? I don't think it's good enough for anybody's child. It's not good enough for my child. Shouldn't be good enough for you either or your children. And yet, without something to compare it to, we're left to just indoctrinate another generation into you graduated from high school, you got to go to college, you got to get your degree, got to get a job, got to get a paycheck because we all don't know any other way to live. Ingredients for success, integrity, discipline, work ethic, culture of excellence, all the things we need to get along and survive and thrive, the things that are uh, a copious in this cornucopia of people at Porkfest, they don't really exist in the outside world. That's why we all like getting together. People who do what they said they would do by the time they said they would do it. You can depend on them. You need some help out there? Raise your hand. People come over and help you. You don't even have to raise your hand. People will notice you're struggling. They'll come over and help you move stuff, set stuff up, get out of the rain, find your room. These things are not taught in school, and I argue by, it's by design, but that's a, that's a rigged argument because I already know the facts behind why it's on purpose. You're going to find out too. This is not part of schooling, and I argue that it is a break individual so that they are easily uh, collectivized. You don't have an individual self-resourceful nature. You're easily collectivized, and as you'll see, that's been the plan for 80 years now. Excuses for the system. Any teachers in here? It's not your fault. Teaching is a noble profession. And it can be done outside the system. They mean well. They're just doing their job. They're just incompetent. It's just all accidental. If schooling's not producing what we need, then we need to ask what 
Well, we need to ask a few more questions, but we need to ask what should be done in its place. And it's not my position to decide for you, but once you see the facts of what the school system is created to be, you'll probably start looking for other alternatives, and that's what freedom's all about. Freedom's about choice. So this question, is it accidental? Is it intentional? And is it planned in advance? Mm. It being the systematic failure of schooling to instill the skills one needs to survive and thrive in the world consistently, not just for 2% of the people who graduate or 3%, but for like 50% or 60%. Like it should work for most students. Most students going through that system should be successful in some, some nature of their, de their definition. Exhibit one, because I'm, I'm a big fan of references and exhibits because this is how you can actually communicate to other people who don't know this. The story sounds great, but I'm not supposed to be a storyteller. I'm introducing you to artifacts of evidence that you can study for yourself very easily through these cheat sheets. The first one is the Dodd Report. The Dodd Report, uh, first, who was Dodd? Norman Dodd was an Ivy League, Ivy League graduate. He graduated from Yale. He had gone to Andover Prep School. He's a very Eastern establishment guy who worked at J.P. Morgan and these Wall Street banks. The United States Congress chose him as the director of research for something called the Cox Committee, when it started, and then it was shut down and re, uh, renamed the Reese Committee. So the director of research for the Reese Committee, Norman Dodd, has this quote in his final report to the Congress. And then they arrived at the point. This is the Carnegie Endowment. They arrived at the point where they said, to prevent a reversion to the pre-World War I, pre-1914 economy, they must control education in the United States. So you have a tax-exempt foundation. This is what the Dodd Report was. It was an investigation into the Guggenheim Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Carnegie Endowment. In the minutes, 1908, the Carnegie Endowment starts figuring out how to break America into little pieces. Part of this study was where they decided to take over education in order to indoctrinate people away from freedom. Now that sounds like an interesting claim. Maybe Mr. Dodd is full of shit. I don't know, but let's go and look into the facts. They defined un-American and subversive as any way uh, trying to change the government beyond means that are constitutional. This was during the Red Scare in the 1950s, and I think that that verbiage is accurate for that time, though many of our philosophical ideas may have evolved beyond that point at this present day. The tax-exempt foundations were doing this in the public interest. What specifically were they doing? Directing education in the United States toward an internationalist viewpoint and discrediting the traditions from which it had formerly been dedicated. If you want evidence that they want to change, they, them, those, want to change your attitudes, behaviors, values, and beliefs, there's a very well-founded tax-exempt foundation stating it in their minutes. But it gets worse. There's quotes on page seven. I'm not going to read all these quotes to you. I'm going to allow you to have those in the cheat sheets. You can read them at home. Freeing the American people from its inherent safeguards to safeguard our traditions. The next one. They concluded, this is the American Historical Association, another tax-exempt foundation that had become internationalist and sought to collectivize Americans. In this one, they said, they concluded that the day of the individual had come to an end in the United States and that collectivism and an increase in the authority of state would be the future. This is the 1920s. This is a century ago. People should have known this before we got here today, right? We sh this actually should be common knowledge among us. This is a currency of liberty and freedom, knowing that there is a they, them, those, they have a plan, they're well-funded, and nobody's touched them for basically the past 100 years. And I'm not saying we have to do anything against them, but we can't do anything for ourselves until we know what they're doing, what that plan is, and then we can move over here now. We can make it obsolete. That's part of how you win the rigged game. In summary, a study of these entities, these tax-exempt foundations, and their relationships to each other seems to warrant the inference that they constitute a highly efficient, functioning whole. These are not tax-exempt foundations working on their own agendas. These are tax-exempt foundations from the top down, all working on working projects to take away individual liberty and to instill collectivism in future generations. I'm going to skip that quote. I'll give it to you in the cheat sheet. The Ford Foundation, they were the internationalist aspect. They sought to defend this collectivism from criticism. 
to indoctrinate adults and to control human behavior. They, ter- they talk in their papers in terms of social engineering and behavior control. In no place in their documents do they say, we would like to help educate the next generation so that they can survive and thrive and protect freedom in this country. Nowhere to be found in their agendas. And this is how think tanks became engines of propaganda. So if we don't know it today, we should. These think tanks, these tax-exempt foundations, the Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, they are not seeking freedom and justice for all. They're seeking plunder and pillage for them and getting plundered and pillaged for the rest of us. And I don't think that's fair. I think we intellectually don't have to take it anymore because we start to find out about it and you start to learn more and it gives you confidence to communicate with other people. Exhibit two, very short exhibit. I don't want to lose your attention with long proofs. The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America by Charlotte Iserby. Anyone familiar with this book? Show of hands. Excellent, excellent book. Very thick book, but the gist is the same. She understood the Carnegie 1934 plan to take away individuality through schooling and to perform the function of installing collectivist behavior on individuals in America. It's a very un-American thing. Exhibit three, the ultimate history lesson, A Weekend with John Taylor Gatto. Has anyone seen this? Oh, a few of you. That was filmed in my living room by chance, me and some friends one day. This gives you the root causes, the history, the underground history of American schooling. And it's not pretty. It starts back in 1806 in a Prussian war with Napoleon where they lose and they get, uh, they lose face, to use a Japanese term. They got uh, humiliated. So they sought to create a schooling system to condition individuals as interchangeable parts. That became our schooling system in the 20th century. Americans went over there. They're like, this is a really good problem. You know, you guys got these all, they won't cross the street unless, oh, okay. Yeah, this is good. We want this. So they brought it here to indoctrinate the next generations. We're in the midst of that. We're like three or four generations deep after they made these decisions. Exhibit four. This will take a minute. Let me take a sip for this one. Is anyone familiar with the DCDC Strategic Trends Program? Excellent. So we're all going to learn something today. This is run by the British government. Where can you find these documents? Right here. It's called Global Strategic Trends. It's on gov.uk. It's the Ministry of Defense for the United Kingdom. They've been making these plans for the past 20 years, and right now they project out to 2050. So the next several decades of everybody's lives on this planet have been planned in advance, and you can go online and you can read these documents, and these are part of the cheat sheet. You will will get everything I'm about to read you. So who? It's the Ministry of Defense, Development, Concepts, and Doctrine Center, DCDC. Global Strategic Trends 2040 is the document we're going to look at. Page 24. The development of the world is likely to experience a degree of transformation as it moves from a consumerist society based on freedom of choice to a more constrained sustainable societal model that provides financial and social rewards to encourage greener practices and discourage waste. Now, if that's a little ambiguous, they're going to clarify what they're talking about. They start looking about strong collective identities, no more individuals. Individualistic societies are likely to experience tensions because individualism is bad and collectivism is good. So they start to plan out their scenarios. And so this is a plan for 20 years from now. This is what all those non-governmental working groups work on. It's this type of plan for the future where, you know, if you look at Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, the state was the parents. They got rid of parents. The state directly bred its, its children to be obedient because parents were, well, they're messing around in the education, I'm sorry, indoctrination of their citizens, right? So that's where these people, these uh, eugenics-believing people, uh, want to take. They want, col- they want collectivism, and they see individualism as a threat. Uh, They're talking about the control of society and the considerable impact by a variety of uh, types of disasters, but there's also uh, extraterrestrial life that they're concerned about and the fact that anybody can come up with a technology that makes nation states obsolete. That's in the last paragraph. So let's use our phones to do something smart. I didn't read all those quotes to you because I don't want you to go to sleep from it, but I do want you to download the cheat sheet. 
So if you take out your phone, you can text PORKFEST to this number. You have a couple handy dandy cheat sheets that have all the quotes in their entirety with the pages and the reference links. PORKFEST to 900-900. So the future they want depends on you. They want you obedient. They want you subservient. They want you sucking on the tit of Netflix, playing some, uh, you know, Fortnite. They don't want you thinking your way out of these problems. They don't want you asking questions. They don't want you interacting with each other. They definitely don't want you interacting in person. And they really don't want you knowing how to walk up the steps, come on stage, talk on a microphone, and have a conversation with people that might lead them out of a dark area, an area where there should be a lot of light. This is education. Education, educare, means to draw out. Like the, the learning is within us. It's what we're meant to do. Everything I've just talked about is how they stifle nature as a, as a way to try to control it. The indoctrination is what the system produces, but you guys all already know this. You don't have to be a product of that system, right? The observation is that freedom is systematically being bred out of the world's population, especially here in America, because that's where it was the biggest threat. It's intentional, it has been planned, it is not accidental, and if I had to summarize it in a meme, it would be that they want to make America Great Britain again. So you have a choice, to think or not to think. And just asking the question is the process of thinking. Do you see how easy it is? We've been taught to think that thinking is hard. Oh, it's hard work. And it's not. It's a beautiful thing when you start to unleash your brain by using question marks instead of de you know, the period at the end of declarative sentences. That's where learning really sparks off. That's where it catalyzes in your mind. So the choice is the essence of freedom. It's the opportunity for growth. That's what choice brings. What we've had up to this part in the 21st century is not choice. It's more indoctrination. It's more broken colleges. It's more long-term debt. Senior citizens who still have college loans and haven't paid them off. This is not how we want to continue unfolding generations of freedom into the world. Freedom is available through choice. You can choose to outgrow the learned helplessness. You can choose to expand your attention. You can choose to focus on your goals. And you can choose to ignore the noise and tune into the signal. That's another thing that this festival is known for. We come out of the noise of the real world. We all tune in the signal for a week. We're all over here in Ag Valley seeing people that are doing their own business without other people in the way, right? So there's a way to do things together. But we cannot keep doing it the way we've been doing it. Because what, to what end? If we just continue down the path, uh, the road we've traveled to get here, where are we going to end up? We need to learn how to confidently and cogently communicate our needs to other people, how to get our needs met in daily life, how to get our needs met socially, privately, professionally, without violence. That's another aspect of freedom. It's intellectual self-defense, physical self-defense. Anybody know the third part? We'll talk about it later. We'll talk about it at the end. How are we going to do this? Anybody have an idea how we can defeat that system that we just saw? It's pretty big. It's well-funded. A lot of people just throw their kids right through it. and I don't see a way to defeat it. What do you got? Right on. All right, so you expose it, and then people know about it, but it's still not a solution, right? So I think, and I'm not telling anybody what to do, but I think if you put the things back that they took out to break the system, then the education would work. People learned through the 1800s, through the 1900s, until they started applying this and methodically breaking it down, breaking it down, having more and more control to the point where children have to raise their hand to go to the bathroom. That's not freedom. Asking permission for it to, you know, to get through life, that's obedience training. There's a lot of obedience that has to be unlearned. How are we going to unlearn obedience? You question it. So the question is, 168, what's the relevance of this number juxtaposed to all of your lives? It's how many hours we all have in a week. 168 hours. It sounds like a lot, right? Now what if you could take less than 10% of your week? 15, 16 hours of your week, 
and start to fill in the gaps that public schooling put in your programming. That makes it not programming anymore because you are at the helm of instilling the skills that you need to go wherever you want to go. How many have taken the traditional course thus far? You've taken uh, public schooling, coll college degree, and you're living your dream. All right, so three people. Three people out of this whole room. Is that good? What about everyone else? That's good for them. What about the rest of us? I think if we learn the skills that they took away, it naturally fills in. You might have a vocation or an interest that you've never been exposed to because you thought in your head, oh, I can't learn that or I couldn't get paid to do that or I don't know how to do that. All these questions that stopped instead of progressing, like we have these feelings and that's the learned helplessness where we stop. I and mean, if you ignore that and just keep going, then you're going to blossom. You're going to unfold your potential. You're going to catalyze it and direct it toward where you would like to go in life. So I created a course called Autonomy. It's not an online course. It's an actual course of action. There's an online component. There's a social component where you learn how to practice all the skills that you learn with other people to gain competence. And that's where real confidence comes from. And then you take that out to the, into the real world and you apply it to where you want to go in life. It's a Swiss Army knife for life. It's a skeleton key for success. Who's this for? It's just for you because you, you're living your dream, right? See? I'm, and I would ask you, but I, I am on a time limit today. Season one, I had 200 students. The youngest was 18. The oldest was older than 70, but let's just call it 70. That uh, people outgrowing indoctrination actively uh, some people are retired looking for additional income. Some people are getting out of school wondering if they need to go to college. Some people are trying to find another job because they just got downsized. There's a whole plethora of paths that people are on, but what I find is the skills you need to be successful on those various paths have a great deal in common. Students graduating, people who are looking for jobs, people who are trying to get their relocation, anybody in this room that has a vocation. If you have your own business, you probably need these skills. They help you out communicating and communicating your message more easily instead of one to one, one to many. What was your motivation for enrolling in the course? I asked the students, these are their answers. Learning, education, advantage, resourcefulness, achievement, growth, and collaboration. I like the resourcefulness one because that's the one that is most useful when calamities happen. Any preppers in the room? You got to learn how to be resourceful. You got to see the opportunity in what other people might think is garbage or junk. Why would people want to do this? Why aren't they just content to, uh, you know, Netflix? There's a new House of Cards probably coming out soon or Game of Thrones on HBO. Why would we do this? So I asked the students, what were your struggles prior to taking the course? Well, fear and anxiety, they, most people get medicated for that. You mean there's other answers than medication? You could learn how to use your brain and take away your own fear and anxiety? Scarcity my mentality, not thinking you can ever have enough. Like if you're working a paycheck job and your bills are bigger than that, the scarcity mentality tells you you can never get out from under this debt. That makes you feel helpless. And that is not natural. Naturally, we all tend to solve problems until we go through an indoctrination process to keep us from doing that naturally. Analysis by paralysis over on the right side. That's another one. There's some highly intelligent, super organized people who just have to think too much through before they take action. So the best exercise for them is jump in the water. Don't test it out. I need to prepare more. Nope, do it. If you do it right now, you'll learn so much more. And then they do it and they come out the other side of the exercise. And I say, how do you feel? Oh, I feel like I would have wasted three weeks preparing for something that I just did perfectly. Okay, so that's the confidence building that happens very rapidly outside of a schooling environment. 15 weekly lectures, I had, I had sold the course as 12. It took us 15 plus two bonus lectures to outgrow the indoctrination. But everyone who participated in the exercises got the results that they are seeking. It's not hard to break through these walls. Most people are just shy. And once you get them through that talking to strangers, how to build rapport, how to be at ease, how to communicate confidently, it's a whole new world. Their work life starts to change. Their personal life starts to change. And sometimes we get some good comments from the spouses that are, that are pretty, pretty interesting. 
So the first thing we do is we unprogram from schooling. The first three lectures I spent, like, here's what schooling is trying to do to you. You've probably been carrying some of that with you. Let's put down that baggage. Was, you know, the learned helplessness, the scarcity mentality. And then we install the faculties of a culture of excellence. Part of it is being excellent to each other. That's one of the rules in the course. No masters, no slaves. That's another rule in the course. I think those are the only two rules in the course. This is how you instill in, in a, a culture of excellence among people. You have people that do what they said they would do when they said they would do it. People who know how to get their time on a calendar and show up for a meeting. People who know how to uh, formulate a professional response. And these are the things that start to open doors because when you have that culture of excellence, you bring it everywhere you go and people start to seek you out and you're no longer needy trying to get a job. People are seeking your expertise. They're seeking your consultation. They're seeking your skills. They're seeking your pleasant nature when things go wrong. Right? Part of picking a team is getting the people that you gel with. I can teach the skills to anybody, but not everybody works and plays well together, especially not as well as everyone here over the years. Uh, it's always been peaceful, pleasant, polite, very polite interactions because you never know who's armed. <laughs> so the absence of the culture of excellence is what I see as one of the major problems holding most people back and holding most companies back. So how do you establish a culture of excellence around you? Methods, principles, strategies, tactics. It's not fluff. It's reusable in your life every day. Now, you could say it's too general and not specific, and I would say, well, that's how teaching is done. I tell you the concept. It's like I provide a dojo. People show up and do the exercises and gain proficiency by practicing with each other. That's where the learning goes on. It's not in the slideshow. I made my course so you could steal the slides. You're not going to get the gist. The gist is in the participation of the exercises. You can't steal it. No masters, no slaves, no excuses. Meta-learning, that's how to learn anything. Hyper-learning, that's how to apply your meta-learning to the thing called the internet. And once you know that, you're off to the races. But you don't have to do it all by yourself. There's a bunch of other people learning in an intensive, focused way how, how to be productive. And I was really pleasantly surprised by how above and beyond I would assign a homework assignment and have expectations here like they would do an audio interview with each other. No, they went on Zoom and filmed it video, and now they're doing, like one of my students called James Corbett and got him for an interview. You teach people these skills, they're off to the races. How to get your skills on, how to talk with anybody, professional problem solving. That means problem solving and getting paid for it. There's a lot of problem solving professions, and most of them use words. Webinars, this is a way to showcase your value from one to many, instead of one on one. This would be good for Lynn, we should have a webinar on free Rost, it calls to the case history and points people to the resources. Just thinking off the top of my head. Interviewing. Knowing both sides of this process will make you extremely comfortable and confident interacting if you need to go get a job, should you not want to be on your own and autonomous as an uh, entrepreneur. Social media as an asset, not a liability. Most people use social media as a liability. And I had students from around the world. So we had Australia, New Zealand, we had people in Europe, we had all sorts of different time zones involved. And that's why I provided a 24-7 dynamic learning environment. So no matter what time they were on, they could interact with each other. I also uh, did role plays to teach them new skills. So it's not just them hearing about it, it's about them interacting and gaining these skills. And they get constructive real-time feedback on the whole process, which is priceless because you don't get that in schooling. This is what the, uh, the online dynamic learning environment looks like. You've got uh, some different rooms. You've got uh, different uh, students participating in exercises. And at one point, a student came into the course. It just it really, really pleased me to have him in the course. Because in 2004, I voted for Michael Badnark as libertarian candidate for president. I knew nothing about libertarian politics at the time. What I knew was this guy I just saw on TV made more sense to me than anybody I'd ever speak on Democrat or Republican. So I voted for Michael that year. And then I learned a little bit more. And I've never voted again. <laughs> this is Michael last week. He was at our house for the Red Pill Expo in Hartford. And he's a very intelligent guy with a lot of cool stories. And he knows how to walk the walk because he definitely talks the talk. This dynamic learning environment, we can quiz to see how long people were on there. So I did a, uh, a stat bot questionnaire and I put in 176 hours teaching and mentoring and coaching that uh, this is over a 30 day period. 
The students put in about 80, 90 hours, the top students. This is not because I told them to, it's because they're actually on there enjoying practicing and interacting with different people and learning the different nuances and adding that to their repertoire as they, as they go through the course. It's a fear and judgment free community, unlike schooling. The mentoring and coaching I do online as available according to the student's uh, subscription. There's different levels to the course uh, that people can buy in. Some people have a project they're looking to launch. They need more consulting from me than somebody who just wants really the, the, the bare bones to get, uh, get some traction in their life and get back on track. So various levels that I created. It's, and I offer opportunities during the course to demonstrate excellence. There are people during the course who have gotten paid jobs because of how they're interacting in the dynamic learning environment, other people who are entrepreneurs that are in the course say, hey, I need somebody to help me with copywriting too. I need somebody to help me with the opt-in on the landing page too. How do you hook it up to the payment gateway again? Great, I have students that learned all these things. I have students that came in knowing some of these, but they're all adding skills so they can bring more balance and more value to their clients and their friends. So what would your life be like if you broke through the biggest boundary holding back your progress right now. We all have boundaries holding back our progress. I don't want you to all yell it out at once, but you might have something in your mind. What would your life be like if you broke through that? Well, for these students, this is a couple weeks ago at the Red Pill Expo in Hartford. These are all graduates of my course who had never met each other prior to this. They had only talked together hundreds of hours online over the 15 weeks. They all wanted to get together, not to meet me, not to see me speak. I'm not that special. They hear me speak five hours every Friday and another three hours on Sunday. They came to meet each other. They made friends in real life. Friends that they're going to, you know, they've, they've gone through some experiences together. Not everybody outside the course can understand the growth. So these, this is what schooling could be like if it wasn't schooling and it was really education. You would make a lifelong bond over meaningful, substantial questions and real growth. Uh, we set up a booth. I had never done any marketing for any of the stuff I did for my podcast or for my films. But for this, I was like, yeah, we're going to get a booth. And then the students like, we got to get our picture taken. I said, all right. So what are you going to do? Do you have a plan? Because if you don't have a plan, this is what the option is. There now exists an opportunity. And you could think... Who are you going to meet? What friends are you going to make? You, it could be a bunch of people in this room. You sat together today as strangers, and next year, when I say last year at Porkfest, previously for yeah, you guys didn't know each other, but now you do a year later. Now, what I said in 2017 was, I was going away to make this course. I said, I'm going to create a course that does all these things, because I had most of it together, so it wasn't like such a moonshot. And then I took a year. I got support for it. And with 200 students signing up, I knew I had something that people appreciated, needed, recognized, and valued. How will your life change on this journey? You're not all at the places you want to be. So if you're not there yet, how are you going to get there? How long is it going to take to get there? How long are you willing to let it take? How soon could it happen? These are all questions. I'm not, I'm not here to answer them for you. I'm basically saying if you think about those questions, you're better off than if you just assume that there's no place left for you to go, that you've done all the growth, you've done all the learning, that your, your potential is fully already catalyzed and realized, and there's nothing else really for you to do. I don't think anybody in this room fits under that. This is a quote. This is a, a wife of one of my students, and then she joined the course after she sent this. She said, I have to tell you, I'm truly impressed in the changes I've seen in my husband thus far uh, since he joined the Tragedy and Hope community and engaged in the autonomy course. He has always been very disciplined and committed, but now I see a shift and greater focus toward the bigger picture. Hope that makes sense. It's hard to describe. This one from Mark Sower. He's another graduate. Thank you, Richard, for challenging me to become a better person. I feel like I've been presented with the rights to passage to manhood during this course. And take a look, uh, to take a good look in the mirror and ask, what are the things that I'm doing that are making me the man I am? And to change them to be the man I can be that is my best. I'm honored to be among the best men that can be found. There's a lot of ladies in the course, a lot of women in the course. Mark was just referring to his, his guy friends that he made around the world during the course. The students on their own created their own YouTube page. So if you went to 
Uh, I don't know what the URL is. I guess I should have thought that out better. But there's a YouTube page for autonomy students and graduates. They're loading up uh, interviews. There's Derek Bros, one of my students, just interviewed. And uh, the interview I mentioned with James Corbett's also on that site. So that feeling when your biggest challenge is no longer your biggest challenge, that's autonomy. Liberty to follow one's will, personal freedom. That's why we are all interested in Porkfest. We're interested in personal liberty, individual liberty, not collectivized. We get our rights from the group. We get our rights because we are living human beings, not because of some piece of paper from 1787. It's because you're a living human being and you understand who, and who you are and why you're here. You're here to explore freedom. Freedom is the absence of slavery. Those two ideas are not reconcilable. Autonomy can benefit anyone who seeks a lifestyle of liberty. What do they fear the most? They fear you with these types of skills because you cannot be divided and conquered. You won't sit around and bicker and argue over trivial, unsubstantial angles. And what you'll do is be able to relate to people on a real human level that we're all trying to protect ourselves, our, our kids, whether you're pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine. We all love our children. So let's connect where we have the commonality, and then let's learn how to bridge these gaps without getting argumentative, emotional, and destructive. Autonomy. It's the opposite of indoctrination. It means you're in control. This problem's existed, as we've mentioned, over 100 years. 110 years, if you count the Carnegie's. Are we going to let it exist another 100 years? There won't be a place like this in another 100 years if we let it to continue to deteriorate. So I took it as a moral imperative to try to make a solution. If you would like to know more about that solution, you could do the same thing you did before, only you text the word autonomy to the same number, 900-900. The way that anybody gets into the course is not to talk to me. You have to talk to one of the students because I find that the students are honest they will readily answer your questions in a way that you might not expect because they're taught to be forthright and get you to the where you want to go. So in order to do that, we have a conversation. You get your questions answered. They figure out where you're trying to go, and they help you strategize a plan to move forward. That's how they got into the course, and that's how the season that's coming up, season two, gets in. Autonomy. Discover. Understand. Excel. Thank you, Porkfest. And... I'm glad to be under time. Thank you.